Let's welcome Dr. John Lundgren, director and founder of Blue Dasher Farm, Ecdiasis Foundation, St. Esteline, South Dakota. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonathan Lundgren. I work at Ecdiasis Foundation and I run Blue Dasher Farm. We're going to talk a little bit about science today and regenerative food production. Um, sort of the answer to pesticides, I think. Farmers are all, all over the country, all over the planet at this point, are kind of rethinking how they produce food. And the, uh, what really got my attention from these folks is, is I was typically going in front of a bunch of farming groups and I'd give talks about how we don't necessarily need to be using so many pesticides and it would be nobody was interested. This was before regenerative agriculture was really a thing. And then I started to meet these farmers and they were doing things that were crazy. Um, they were growing traditional crops and livestock, but they were, weren't worried about insect pests, pests at all, in fact, weeds a little bit. And uh, what they were doing, I thought couldn't be done. And we started to look into it a little bit further and found that in fact, what these guys and gals are doing is completely unique and uh, it's very real. And it's a very practical solution that everybody wins. Uh, so something that we ended up going all in on. What is this thing called regenerative agriculture? Um, you see a lot of different definitions out there. Um, these are, this is one I like, and this is the one that we use here at Ecdysis. Um, You're increasing soil health, increasing life on your farm, while growing nutritious food profitably. You can start adding in water, you can start adding in soil carbon, you know, invasive species, reducing pollution, you know, fighting climate change, all of those things are elements of this definition, um, increasing farm resilience and the resilience of our rural communities. So it's also a really important one. But at the end of the day, I think this really captures it well. So a few years ago, I followed the bees and most of the nation's bees go out to California to pollinate almonds. And so I live up in South Dakota. That's where most of the nation's bees spend their summers. And uh, I figured out very quickly, anything that I'm doing up in South Dakota to help save the bees is completely negated when they come out here. And this is what it looks like. Um, it's crops that are grown. They've desertified the Central Valley of California, which used to be wetlands. It is now a desert and they maintain it on chemotherapy. They use pesticides and, and, um, and fertilizers and, and water and just pump it in, trying to keep things going. Um, when I said, we need to study regenerative ag and soil health out here, the industry said soil health won't work here. And so we decided, okay, well, we're not easily daunted. And so we started a project. Tommy Fenster did, in fact. The work is now um, in review with um, uh, Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and we just did a very simple experimental design. Find regenerative organic almond production and compare it to their conventional neighbors, okay? Can this work? What is regenerative? Well, um, this is not Photoshopped. Uh, this is a conventional orchard right next to a regenerative orchard. Um, the regenerative orchard does not use tillage. They do not use pesticides. They don't have to be organic, but many of them are. Um, they maintain perennial ground cover and they do things like adding compost, compost teas. And then some of these folks are going so far as to integrate livestock into that system. And you see the alternative over there uh, for the conventional. These are the results um, in these side-by-side -side comparisons. We did 16 orchards and some, and we have another 30 orchards that we added to this study this year. Soil carbon is 30% higher. That goes, that goes down uh, for the first uh, 30 centimeters or so. Soil health significantly increased in the regenerative orchards. Water. This one will change California agriculture. Every almond requires two gallons of water to produce. Water infiltrated the soil six to 22 times faster 
in the regenerative almond production. That's going to change everything because right now water is the currency for production of crops in the Central Valley. Life on these farms was through the roof in the regenerative farms. We found six-fold more biomass of invertebrates. However, pests were exactly the same. And when we showed this graph to one of our producers, the conventional producers, he looked at the data and he said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I did everything that I was told from the universities, from the USDA, from the almond board. I followed best management practices and I sprayed insecticides five times last year. It was thousands and thousands of dollars I spent. And what you're telling me right now is the guy right across the road didn't spray at all and he had the same number of pests that I did. And I don't believe that. But that's the power of science. He changed 160 acres of his orchard systems over to regenerative this year. And now we're studying that transition. So this is why we need science so desperately right now. Yields were exactly the same in these two treatments. Profits in the regenerative were twice as high. And it's with this data that we're motivating some of the largest almond producers in California to completely change their operation. Why isn't regenerative agriculture mainstream? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. Change is hard, isn't it? But I also think that science is, is to blame. And the way that we do our science right now is very much devoted to um, solving symptoms rather than investigating underlying problems. So that's why we decided to rethink how we conduct agricultural science. And uh, Blue Dasher Farm is where we're doing that uh, in Eastern South Dakota here. This is our headquarters. We're going to be opening up additional hubs across the country. Like I said, we need to be focused on the underlying problems Pesticides are not the problem, they are a symptom. Until you solve the problems, you're not gonna get anywhere on the pesticide question. We also need to rethink how scientists are motivated. How do we judge the success of these people? Um, as a scientist, I am judged whether or not I am worthy by how many peer-reviewed papers I published, uh, how many millions in grants I sequestered, uh, graduate students, how many of those I pumped through the puppy mill, uh, how many committees I served on. I was good at all of these things, all right? I was really good. I, like, was one of the best in the country. Uh, the president gave me an award in the White House. But I looked at this list one day and I said, how many of these things do farmers care about? None of them. We've become completely disconnected from the people that we're trying to serve. The scientist, and the only way you get a job is by adhering to this system. And so as a result, science is in this self-perpetuating rut that we just can't seem to break out of. And so that's why I quit. And we now assess our success based on how well we've integrated science back into food communities again. How many acres we've changed. How many relationships we've built with the people that we're trying to help. And peer-reviewed science is certainly a part of that. And I think it's an important part, but it's not number one anymore. So we decided to try to tackle this question of what is a regenerative farm? Well, there's a lot of people hand waving right now. Oh gosh, we've got regenerative. We know what regenerative is. And if you fill out this 52 page survey of all of these questions about your operations, uh, we will designate you as regenerative. But nobody's actually tested any of these things. And no farmer in their right mind would try to go through one of these questionnaires. I mean, it's ridiculous. Somebody behind a desk somewhere decided they were gonna to try to define what regenerative was. And it's not practical and it's not usable. Um, and there's more and more of these systems coming out every year. 
So we decided we've got about a million dollars worth of research sitting on our, on our computers, and we actually had to develop a system for comparing regenerative and conventional rangelands and conventional and regenerative croplands in order to conduct research out there. Why don't we test our system? <laughs> what a concept, huh? Why don't we put a little data behind this? So for us, it was really important that these systems were very simple, okay? Very transparent. We got it down to about eight or nine questions for cropland, and we got it down to about four questions for rangelands. And we decided, okay, it, it's a yes or no question, right? You can actually address this to any farmer in about three minutes and have your idea of whether or not this farm is actually regenerative, okay? Tillage, do you till or no? Do you use agrochemical? Um, yes or no. Cover crops, are you using those? Yes, okay, that's good. Uh, how are you managing your field margins? Are you integrating livestock? And with uh, rangelands, it all comes down to abandoning pesticide use and agrochemical use, keeping your cattle tight or your livestock in a tight pack, moving them frequently, and allowing that pasture to rest afterwards. You do those four things and it seems to be very predictive of how well you're going to respond, okay? So our scoring system had to be simple, transparent, transferable. It had to work in all kinds of different environments. It had to be scalable. So any size operation can use it. Incorruptible, that's important. We do not want industrialized regenerative. Okay. And it has to be replicable. Right? It always has to work. The more regenerative practices you use, the more soil carbon you sequester. The healthier your soils. The more plant biomass you're, you're increasing on your rangelands and in your cropland. How many critters are out there? How much life are you conserving? Scales directly with how many practices in our scoring system. How much money you make? That also scores directly with how many regenerative practices you're running. But one interesting aspect of what we saw, and this is true of almost every one of these graphs, I don't know if you caught it, but there's two clouds of data. There's one down towards the left and there's one up towards the right. Farms don't survive for very long in the middle. You don't get to just dip your toe in. You either have to adopt a regenerative system or you have to go back to being conventional. And, and the more practices that you end up adopting within these regenerative systems, the more of these positive outcomes that you end up seeing. So it's a really exciting opportunity for us to try to understand these regenerative systems. And we're currently trying to optimize this even further. Is this the end all beat all? No, but it's really the first time that we've ever tried to put data behind the definition of regenerative. And I think it can help us guide our discussion so we don't get a lot of cheaters moving in. Because there, <laughs> there was one group that said, well, we tried your scoring system and we're trying to get 80 million acres into regenerative this year. I don't know, none of our re regenerative uh, cropland ended up scoring very high. I'm like, well, if you set the bar low enough, most of the US ag is already regenerative for crying out loud. So it is important for us to have some sort of an idea of what it is that we're talking about. We can make regenerative agriculture conducive to life again. Honestly, we don't have a choice in the matter. I often get after giving these presentations to farmers, especially conventional farmers, um, what's it gonna cost me to change? I love these ideas, what's it gonna cost? Wrong question. What's it gonna cost you not to change? It's gonna cost you your farm. This is the future, folks. It's gonna cost you your grandkids. Is that worth it? I hope not. We wouldn't be here without a tremendous group of young, enthusiastic scientists uh, as well as your support. 
we cannot run this kind of research without you, okay? Please consider donating to us. Uh, ecdysis foundation means shedding the old skin. It's a geeky entomology term for metamorphosis and blue dashers are a cool uh, environmentally uh, very poignant uh, dragonfly species that we love. And so that's, uh, you can follow us on social media if you'd like, all of our science is there and available. So thank you guys very much. Let's welcome Joanne Baumgartner, Executive Director, Wild Farm Alliance, Watsonville, California. Hello, I'm Joanne Baumgartner with the Wild Farm Alliance. We promote a healthy, viable agriculture that protects and restores wild nature. And my talk today is about benefiting from nature on the farm and in the wider landscape. Each native ecosystem Shoot, what happened? Sorry. I'll start over. Okay. Hello, my name is Joanne Baumgartner, and I am the executive director of Wild Farm. Sorry, I'm starting to get nervous. I don't, I don't even want to say that. Uh, do I? Because Jay just, do I? I'm just going to say uh, my talk today is about benefiting from blah, blah, blah. Okay. 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 Hello, my talk today is about benefiting from nature on the farm and in the wider landscape. Native ecosystems like prairies have a myriad of interconnections. Every niche is filled and diversity reigns. The plants and animals rely on and regulate each other. The immense diversity of soil microbes support plant growth and the plants roots support them while protecting soil from erosion. As they grow and die, the decomposing insects help to break down the duff layer and lots of carbon is stored more carbon than we could ever hope to store in a farming situation. The flowers have evolved with pollinators to ensure their continued existence and the continued existence of the pollinators uh, occurs too. Predation is a big part of the system and someone's eating someone else all the time from lizards eating beetles to hawks consuming prairies, prairie dogs. Each native ecosystem is like a functioning library of native species and ecosystem processes that we need to learn from and emulate. Some like this native oak woodland store lots of carbon in the wood and can support up to 500 different caterpillar species that birds and others rely on to raise their young. So when you walk out on a farm, there are four elements to consider of what a good farm looks like. These are related to nature that we all have evolved from. And by including them, we can benefit from nature's processes. So it's keeping the soil covered with crops, cover crops, grasses, native and non-native and non-invasive plants. These can be used by insects and rodents, lizards and snakes and low foraging birds and other animals. Flowers on the farm is super important. Um, they support beneficial insects that help reduce toxic pesticides. And they provide floral resources, nectar, pollens, catkins for bees and beneficial birds. The third element is structure. Shrubs and trees are providing food and nesting and cover for all kinds of animals. And the fourth is evidence of wildlife. Either you see them or you see their prints, bees and birds and, and other animals. And these all make up what a farm really should look like if it's going to benefit from wild nature. And be, besides us benefiting, we need to think about uh, what's happening in the world right now. There's an insect apocalypse, where there's uh, such a reduction um, in, in, uh, that's documented worldwide 
or in many places in the world. And, and, and we think it's from climate change, insecticides, herbicides, light pollution, invasive species, and changes in land use, agriculture and urban land use. We also know there's a decline of North American birds. We've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And birds can be beneficial, as I've um, alluded to, uh, helping to uh, reduce pests, insects, and rodents. What's really good is that the National Organic Program uh, requires biodiversity conservation, requires farmers maintain or improve soil, water, wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife. We've worked tirelessly with the organic community to help them understand how they can conserve biodiversity and benefit from it. Here are some publications that we've put out uh, to do just that. But one of the problems that is still happening with the organic label is that native ecosystems can uh, be intact one day and destroyed the next, and that land can be certified immediately. And that's happening because there's this perverse incentive to uh, that uh, when you can uh, transition uh, uh, conventional land to organic, it takes three years, but you could turn a native ecosystem over to agriculture overnight. So we've worked with the National Organic Standards Board, which is a guiding body for the organic rule to change that. They have, um, sorry, they have um, uh, almost unanimously agreed that the NOP, the organic program, um, make a rule that um, will not allow this to happen. And now that we have a new administration, we are gonna be working hard and may need your help too, to, um, to, to make sure that uh, rule uh, is enacted. So now I wanna switch a little bit to uh, birds in agriculture. Uh, this uh, image is showing how research has been conducted on these crops around the world uh, about avian pest control and how beneficial birds are in, in these different crops in reducing pest insects. I wanted to share with you um, a few uh, quick stories about how farmers are supporting nature. Um, this is Emily Reinhardt of Davis Ranches, and they are putting in a couple of miles of hedgerows and riparian habitat to um, support birds and beneficial insects on their farm. Javier Zamora, with JSM Organics is conserving repair, <coughs> riparian habitat and wetlands on his farm and benefiting from it. This is Ames Morris, uh, Morrison of Medlock Ames uh, Winery who um, grows uh, about 20% uh, of, or raises wine grapes on about 20% of his 340 acres of land. The rest is conserved in wild areas and he um, is adamant that those wild areas are helping him to uh, manage his, his production. This is Dennis Tamura with Blue Heron Farms and he has about 32 nest boxes up uh, and says when the tree swallows come to the farm uh, to use the boxes that his the flea beetle uh, damage to coal crops is really reduced. Ron Rosenbrand from Spring Mountain Vineyards has 800 bluebird boxes up in um, their vineyard. And uh, he his thinks and researchers um, have documented that these bluebirds uh, using the boxes are reducing a pest insect that transmits a disease that kills the grapevines and grapevines are worth a lot of money. So. He, and he uh, um, celebrates the, the birds, he loves them. And finally, this is uh, Drew uh, Rivers at Full Belly Ranch. And Full Belly has 
hedgerows and riparian habitat around about each 10 acres of their 400 acres. And so these growers are bringing nature back to the farm. They're benefiting from it and supporting biodiversity in our world. Thank you. Let's welcome Chip Osborne, board member, Beyond Pesticides, President Osborne Organics, Marblehead, Massachusetts. Good afternoon. I'd like to speak with you about the basics of adopting organic land care practices on your own properties, on public properties in your communities, and particularly in those spaces where children congregate and play. We are at a point in time when the discussion about pesticide safety, advocacy, and necessity is front and center. From the organic land care perspective, our approach is we simply do not need pesticides to manage the aesthetics in a landscape. We have alternative strategies that have been proven to work. We do not need pesticides to provide quality athletic fields for our children. We do not need pesticides to maintain a beautiful park. The pictures you see scrolling on the side are all photographs of organically managed properties at various seasons of the year and in different regions of the country. More and more, we are seeing people in the conventional industry that are acknowledging that organic strategies can produce the desired results. I will talk to you a bit about how that happens and what needs to be in place in order to experience success. What we are talking about is a different way of looking at land management. It's different from what most of us were taught. The focus on lawn and turf management, as well as our gardens, beds, and trees, has focused on synthetic petroleum-based inputs for fertility and nutrition, and some combination of synthetic pesticides for pest control. A pest in this case is an insect, weed, or disease. The focus has largely been on product as opposed to process. During the 1950s, we were offered a series of products they created an expectation that exists to this day. The concept of the perfect landscape was developed and when herbicides took away clover and robbed the grass of nitrogen, an industry was poised to deliver that nitrogen in an immediately available chemical form. I want to stress that because we're talking about moving away from the chemicals that created that expectation, we are confident in the organic industry that we can meet expectations with alternative strategies and products. When we are specifically talking about grass areas and the management of those spaces, we are addressing multiple issues. The days of chemical management with chemical fertilizers and pesticides should be winding down. There is no shortage of science that talks about the negatives of both of these types of materials. There is also science that supports working with a natural system the way nature intended plant material to grow. There's no question that there's probably too much grass in the world, and we are guilty of putting it where it does not belong. I was on a call yesterday in my role as a municipal elected official and was being asked to look at a new landscape plan for a school. The original design called for different types of plant material to be planted outside of the building. Because the landscaping is the last thing to happen and the budget was running out, the decision was made by the landscape architect to take out all of the plant material from that part of the design and replace it with grass. Grass is less expensive to install. The odds of that grass surviving in an acceptable condition over the next two to four years is minimal. My community of Marblehead, Massachusetts has a regulation in place and it has been in place for the past 20 years that prohibits the use of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers on town-owned land. Putting grass in this portion of the landscape is going to lead to problems and most communities would readily reach for an herbicide. Grass will never go away. It will, however, need to be managed in a more environmentally friendly and safer way. Grass for public parks, sports fields, golf, and a reasonable amount of lawn will always be appropriate and will never go away. We do need to learn to manage these spaces organically. When we look at the fact that a conventional or chemical approach is generally product centric and materials are put down based on calendar dates, 
we understand how easy it is to get into that rotation. Synthetic nitrogen is introduced and the grass grows. Any weeds that emerge in that area are then controlled with either an herbicide put down before the weed develops or one that is put down after the fact. It is as simple as that and it has been reduced to a calendar and a series of bags. I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to minimize what it takes to manage the highest profile sports and golf turf. It is significantly more complex than calendars and bags. The scenario that I described to you is one that the typical landscape professional, homeowner, school district, or municipality might follow. Organic management of lawns and turf is different. There is some degree of education that needs to be obtained in order to do it properly and successfully. Just as someone was trained in the conventional industry, they need to be trained in the organic industry. What organic is not is simply swapping out product from something that is determined to be not desirable into a more desirable one. When the attempt is made to develop an organic program by swapping out fertilizers and pesticides, to organic compatible materials and doing nothing else, the result is usually less than satisfactory or it can be an outright failure and very often it is. Organic management works within a system. We have developed a systems-based approach to natural turf management that involves embracing three distinct concepts. These concepts are all individually and equally important. The real power is combining them into a manageable systems-based strategy. The first and most important is a strong attention paid to the soil. Soil is the foundation of the landscape and a healthy biologically active soil is essential to the successful management of lawns, beds, and trees. We routinely perform soil tests where we look at the physical composition of the soil, the soil chemistry, the soil biological life. We address each of these areas and then work to balance them and understand how best to improve the overall health and quality of the soil. Healthy biological life is central to organic management. We work to enhance the underground portion of the natural nitrogen cycle. We encourage the growth of microbial life because we know that it is the consumption of a single cell bacteria by a higher level predator that ultimately ends in the release of plant available nitrogen. And this is the logical starting point. It involves understanding these microbes at a very basic level. We also understand that it takes more than just fertilizer to encourage their growth and health. We are introducing foods that feed these organisms in order for them to function at the highest level. We do not just focus on nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from a bag because we know these materials are not plant foods. They are simply raw materials that do specific things within the physiological function of the plant. The second part of this protocol is revisiting proper horticultural practices. Cultural practices are th things like aeration for the relief of compaction and the introduction of oxygen into the soil managing a thatch layer if it is present, adopting irrigation practices that best support the health of the grass plant, overseeding to maintain thickness and density, and top dressing to improve the overall quality of the soil and the plant. These cultural practices have taken a back seat in many conventional management programs. Because we have a quick fix instant gratification of synthetics, good cultural practices can sometimes be eliminated or reduced. We understand that in an organic program, they are central to success. If we pay attention to each of these practices and do them properly, we are best supporting the overall health of the plant. So those first two are part of this protocol. And it is not by accident that the third part is the product input side and we put it last. We do not need product input in many cases. We use input to directly support the grass as well as supporting microbial life. There are times when we do need to introduce product and when we do, it is governed by our soil testing. Our goal is to do what we need in the first 
two or three years of a transition so that after that time we are able to reduce. We use organic compatible product and we defer to the Organic Materials Review Institute certification. OMRI is a nonprofit that was created in response to the National Organic Program. It approves materials allowed in organic production. We do not use synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, and we rely on natural materials for fertility. They may be grains, minerals, or animal byproducts. When we do use pesticides, we are using those that are exempt from the US EPA registration process because they fall into a category called minimal risk pesticides. We do use US EPA registered pesticides that are biorational in nature meaning that the active ingredient is one that is found in nature, very often bacteria or fungi that have insecticidal properties. It is a successful integration of these three concepts that becomes the foundation of a successful organic program. By following a feed the soil approach as opposed to a feed the plant approach, we are starting at the beginning. An organic management plan is simply putting a series of preventative steps in place so that pests and problems do not get out of control. It can be as simple as that. A healthy biologically active soil can assist in managing many fungal pathogens. That same biomass has the ability to outcompete some insect pests at their egg stage. And a healthy, vigorously growing turf grass system goes a long way towards preventing weed pressures that historically we have reached for chemicals to control. It is important to seek education to get an understanding of this process. We do not say that every practitioner needs to be a scientist and understand all of the detailed science. It is a good idea to understand there is significant science behind the protocols of an organic program. There are educational opportunities available to pursue this kind of knowledge. It is focused on practical application and how to take scientific concepts and turn them into a successful nutritional and plant management program. I believe that we're at a tipping point and so many people have worked for a long time to get here. It is generally now accepted that the discussion of moving away from the cosmetic use of pesticides is prevalent and is in most communities. Our efforts involve strategies that make school districts, municipalities, private contractors and local and state officials aware that organic management can be done. We should be looking at what we're using on our grass areas and particularly those areas where children play. And we do need to learn how we can manage them with alternative practices and products. I'm pleased to be part of this panel with people that are addressing different aspects of this issue. You will hear from different ends of implementation. You will hear from those folks that have been instrumental in coordinating efforts at the municipal level, as well as those on the ground making it happen. Beyond Pesticides is instrumental in taking a leadership role in moving organic strategies into communities around the country. This is all in response to a request for change. If we all work together, systemic change will happen and we will move to a time when we can be comfortable that our lands are being cared for and meeting expectations in a safer and healthier manner. Thank you. Let's welcome Molly Rockamon, founding director, Earth Dance Organic Farm School, Ferguson, Missouri. Hi there, my name is Molly Rockamon. I'm the founding director of Earth Dance Organic Farm School in St. Louis, Missouri, Ferguson to be exact. And I just want to share with you all a story of hope. Um, I know the theme of this forum is cultivating healthy communities. And um, I want to let you know about the farm community that we are growing in Ferguson, Missouri. So I guess to start off, um, to, little, to let you know where we are located, we are right on the border of Ferguson and Kinlock, Missouri on what's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. This land was once occupied by the Missouri Osage and Illini peoples and was stolen from them by the United States government. 
And um, it is important, I think, to acknowledge the land that we're on, that we're currently stewarding. The Miller family established the farm as um, settlers in, in 1883. That's before the city of Ferguson was even established. And the third generation of farmers, Al and his wife, Caroline, um, kept, had kept the farm going their entire lives and didn't have any kids to uh, keep the farm in production. And um, so this is a little bit about the history of, of how I came to be there. I was actually a teenager when my dad brought me out to the farm um, and thought, you know, as his vegetable eating nature loving daughter would just like to see an organic vegetable farm in his hometown of Ferguson. And so the, this one experience of just walking up onto this farm always stuck with me as I went away to school and actually worked overseas and worked on other farms and or worked, yeah, worked in other places in particular, um, developed a love for working on farms. And I always wondered what was going to happen to this land that I had been um, so enchanted by as a teenager, given that there was no next generation. Um, Alan Caroline didn't have any kids to keep the farm going. So that really, for me, provided the impetus to come back to St. Louis, my hometown, and start this organization to keep that beautiful land in production. Um, the soil is what some soil science labs have, have said is some of the best soil they've ever seen. And I would credit the decades of incredible soil stewardship um, by the Miller family as being the reason for that. So um, they were really pioneers of biological, what they called biological farming or natural farming before their time. There was write-ups on the Millers um, and area newspapers. And so we really sit on the shoulders of, of people who have um, had amazing practices in organic farming long before um, the National Organic Program, for example, even existed. For example, they would buy praying mantises and ladybugs and release them on the farms to eat up the aphids, or um, they would bring um, horse manure from local horse stables out onto the fields in the fall and let it age all winter long and, and use that to really build up the soil's natural fertility. So fast forward to the year that I came back to St. Louis, which was about 2007, and I um, met a gentleman who was selling produce at the Ferguson Farmer's Market. And I was so excited to hear that he was at the old Mueller farm um, since I had always wondered again what was going to come of it. And uh, I asked if there was a way I could just work with him. And he said he paid in sugar snap peas. And I gladly took him up on that offer. And um, that was really where the seed for Earth Dance was planted. So Earth Dance is an, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that we call an organic farm school. We're located in a predominantly low income black neighborhood in Ferguson and on the border of Kinloch, as I mentioned. Um, as a privileged white woman, I, I fully acknowledge that there are often um, white folks like myself uh, taking up space in uh, in neighborhoods of color and with, of course, meaning well, but also not um, not being from the community, not being of the community that we are now. The farm is now a part of. Um, so it's with that lens that I think it's really important to come to this work. Um, the reckoning that Ferguson, St. Louis, the greater United States has had when it comes to black lives in this country and how they've been treated for centuries now um, is something that I think is really important to in particular reckon with in the food and farming movement. Um, I think it's important to just acknowledge where we're at, like literally the geography of the place where we are 
And if we want to work towards justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, JEDI, like we like to call it, um, we need to first acknowledge where we've gone wrong and that we can't talk about sustainable agriculture as if it's you know, a way of hearkening back to those days that I mentioned with the millers just, you know, when they were running mules on the land and, and just bringing ladybugs and praying mantises, that's, that's just a piece of the puzzle that may be referring to the ecological sustainability, but we need to stop forgetting that farms are as much as they are places of biodiversity with non-human creatures, they're also social organisms. And so we really need to acknowledge the people who have been on the land, who have been taken advantage of on the land in the past and who we no longer will stand silent as they're taken advantage of in our communities around the country. And so, um, yeah, at Earth Dance, we're trying, you know, it's a social experiment of sorts. We're trying to really live in and work in anti racist ways, um, bringing together healthy food production, farm based education, and community empowerment in ways that are really uplifting and letting community members tell their own stories and really letting people uh tell us the kind of vision they see for themselves and their families when it comes to health um last year we grew over 13 and a half tons of produce and that went into the greater st louis community it was all grown you know using certified organic methods um while also training new growers while also providing jobs for ferguson area teenagers while also accepting SNAP and EBT benefits at the local Ferguson farmers market. And this year we're really excited to launch a pay what you can farm stand, um, as well as we have been in a, a planning partnership with the Ferguson Florissant School District to figure out how we can best serve our youth in our community uh, with farm-based education. We also are offering a paid summer apprenticeship opportunity for people aspiring to have jobs and, and future careers in agriculture. Those are just some of the, you know, the ways in which we are applying these principles. But I think at the real core of what we're doing is trying to, you know, demonstrate that we don't have to actually separate um, racial equity work in this bubble over here and food production in this bubble over here and um, fair food distribution over here, that these things actually can coexist. We obviously need a lot of policy changes in this country to make it easier so that we're not so dependent on charitable contributions to do this work. But, you know, we're going to take where we're at and move forward. So now I'd like to invite you to watch a short video about Earth Dance and some of the many folks who have found community at this farm in Ferguson. I like the fact that it's a whole system. It's it's you put together life, you put together people, you put together the earth, you put all that together into one whole piece. It brings together in a way that I can't think of anything else that does, brings all the components of life together. That's really beautiful. <laughs> the changes in this, this garden are unbelievable. I mean, it really has come a long, long way. Connected to Earth Dance Farm through uh, a former chair of the board who invited me to the farmers' formal. And at that point, my wife was really urging us to eat more organic, so we signed up for a CSA. 
And I misread the instructions. I thought you had to volunteer four hours a week or at least four hours a month. It turned out to be four hours a season. But I started coming on Friday mornings, and I have been doing so ever since. For me, three or four hours out here on a Friday is just a zen time. I just kind of zone out. I, you know, enjoy the harvesting. I enjoy meeting the young people. I was stumbling across a uh, place to volunteer, talking to my community service coordinator, and uh, she gave me a list of places that I could possibly volunteer with, help out, and then I saw Earth Dance, and it kind of gained my attention. I was like, I wonder what they're about. So after that, I volunteered at the Earth Day Festival, and the rest is history. Earth Dance is probably like the coolest place that I've been this summer. I think everybody should come to Earth Dance at least once, it, like whether they have like experience in farming or not at all. I just wanted to get reconnected with the earth and outdoors, and I saw this as a great opportunity to do so for myself. I do love fresh food, fresh vegetables, fresh herbs. As I look back on it, it was a, a good experience all around. Um, and I tell people about it, and nobody quite understands. I think you just have to come out here. It's a great, like an oasis in this city. To me, the, uh, the adult training is really neat but what I enjoy most are the youth. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the most moving moments for me, I was sitting with a young man the year after Michael Brown had been shot, uh, who was African American from Ferguson about Michael Brown's age. And he just turned to me and he said, this is the most peaceful place I've ever been. I love this place. This was just one of the places where everything was different in Ferguson. It was just such a cool community involves so many people from Ferguson, so many youth from Ferguson in a really constructive way. I think it's a farm that's growing people, growing character, growing vegetables, uh, growing values, and contributing to a better world. And that's where, that's where the biggest gift was, the community that I found there. Yes, there's something about working beside someone for four hours, sweating and accomplishing a task that brings you together and helps you form bonds that you wouldn't otherwise. Both locally, Ferguson, and as a community as a whole, this is a great crossroads for a variety of people, ideas, and it's a place where we can connect. And you might connect with people that you usually wouldn't connect with otherwise in our regular streams of life. So I think that's what makes um, Earth Dance an amazing place. I'm a neighborhood person who loves to farm, and I like to eat healthy, and that's how I got involved with Earth Dance, because it's right in the neighborhood. I love the uh, idea that they are here in our community, helping out on our food. I'd never driven a tractor before, and I got to drive a tractor. It was really, really fun. I enjoyed that. Fell in love with sun gold tomatoes and ground cherries, which now are part of my life. Never even heard of ground cherries before. But it was it was a beautiful, beautiful summer. And much as it did the things I went there for, the break from the chaos and, and uh, the learning and the physical challenge, it was the spirit that really, really fed me. It was, it was life-giving when I needed it. It was a gift to me to be there for the summer.